Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to La Prabhupada Guru Maharaj and all glories to you. All glories to the assembled devotees. Uh, this is Anjali from London, welcoming you on to the His Holiness Chandramuni Maharaj's daily call. I thank you all for attending the session. Guru Maharaj, we have 17, uh, 16 participants, um, uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Yeah, please put up the same verses we've been doing each day. It's from the uh, uh, seventh canto, chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. Okay. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Norvani Pacharine Nir Vishesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Panchakalpa Tarupascha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Gatitanam Bhavnevyo Vaishnavyo Namo Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Siradvaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhaktarindu Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so go to the uh, translation and leave it there. Okay, so for the last two days, and today is the third, we've been discussing this verse. And as we had mentioned previously, um, this verse, or the series of five verses actually, um, give a complete picture through description of what are the characteristics and personality principles that re are required to be adopted by those who engage in devotional service. In other words, these principles are meant to be followed by human beings, as it says here in the translation. And then the first 21 listings are the principles, or you might say the characteristics. And as we mentioned yesterday in our discussion, then we have the nine activities of devotional service. So in the process of devotional service, there are nine activities, hearing about the Supreme Lord and his qualities, characteristics, pastimes, names, chanting about them, remembering them, um, offering prayers to one or more of these characteristics of the Lord, um, or containing these characteristics of the Lord. Uh, the next one is worshiping the Lord, Archanam. Sometimes it's known as deity worship. Uh, then we have serving the lotus feet, and that means uh, carrying out services that are on the personal level to the Lord. It can also indicate some aspects of deity worship. It also includes visiting the holy places of pilgrimage where the Lord performed its pastimes. And it also means honoring the festivals of the Lord, such as Jan Bastami, Ram Nomi, like that. And then we have uh, servitorship. That means carrying out various services with the desire to please the Lord. And then we have uh, becoming the friend of the Lord. And then we have satisfying the Lord by surrendering everything. So these uh, nine process of devotional service are giving a lot of explanation in the scriptures. 
And as we mentioned yesterday, there are certain personalities who have perfected these. And we'll mention them again for those who aren't here. And that is uh, Parikshit Maharaj perfected hearing about the Lord. Sugadev Goswami perfected chanting about the Lord. Prahlad Maharaj was perfected in remembering the Lord. Akrura and offering prayers to the Lord. Uh, Prithu Maharaj in worshiping the Lord in his deity form. Lakshmi Devi serving the lotus feet of the Lord. Hanuman and carrying out different services in order to please the Lord. Arjun becoming a friend of the Lord and uh, Bali Maharaj surrendering everything to the Lord, including his entire life. So outside of these, there are no other, what we say, ways to execute devotional service. These are the nine angas of bhakti and bhakti is included in that. As we mentioned, uh, the uh, chanting of the holy names we has been given a particular position within the uh, age we live in as the Yuga Dharma means for self-realization. And therefore, if one adopts any of these other processes, angas, in relationship to a focus on devotional service, in other words, if one focuses on uh, remembering Krishna, still they have to chant the holy names of the Lord. In other words, although each process is distinct, the process of chanting the holy name because of Lord Chaitanya, because of the Yuga Dharma, because of the focus of this Yuga Dharma as the means for self-realization, the, the chanting has to be included in the other eight. But it's also significant to understand that the process of hearing, hearing about Krishna, is also very fundamental to all the processes of bhakti. Because without hearing, how do you know what to chant? Without hearing, how do you know what to remember? Without hearing, how do you know prayers? In other words, hearing is the source of knowledge, which uh, directs one in, in carrying out the specifics of any of the other forms of devotional service. But hearing in itself, it can be perfected and one can be, one can reach perfection simply by perfecting the process of hearing about the Lord. Now, there are two types of persons who perform these nine angas. Those who are acquiring or uh, developing their devotional service and those who have achieved perfection. So in other words, those two persons, although doing the same thing, are on completely different levels. It's just like a person who is going to school to learn and a person who has graduated and has received this diploma. So both have, are in the process of getting knowledge, but one is still getting knowledge and the other one has achieved the results of the knowledge. So there are, so therefore there are two ways. So therefore, for one who is practicing, we'll use the example of hearing, that hearing is on a high level where they actually realize Krishna through the process of hearing. Whereas for those of us who are practicing and developing the uh, um, attraction to Krishna through the process of hearing, we may, we may not be experiencing the complete power of the hearing process. Just like, um, we'll give you the example, and the example is quite used quite often. Uh, those who are, are afflicted with the disease called jaundice, it is understood that they give as a cure sugarcane juice. Now for a jaundice person, sugarcane juices taste bitter. Jaundice is a disease of the liver, and it causes one to have a bitter taste in eating, tasting, tasting things that are sweet. 
But still, the cure is the sugar cane juice as one continues to take the juice. Gradually, the sweetness of the juice starts to reveal itself. And at the same time, the disease is going down. So one can understand how the disease is going down and by how much one is realizing or experiencing the process of bhakti. Um, so we are, uh, according to the level of the qualifications and executions of our devotional service, we are tasting the happiness and the knowledge in relationship to our practice, which is really the purification of our consciousness. As consciousness becomes free from the contamination of material dirt, because material life is, is, like, is like dirt. If you take something clean and you throw dirt over it, then that clean object is no longer desirable anymore. So one has to wash away the dirt. So washing away of the dirt is the process of bhakti. And dirt is a covering. It's a contamination. It's undesirable. So our, our material characteristics that we have developed in relationship to association with the material energy are like different types of dirt. These different types of dirt come in the form of various types of what we call anarthas or unwanted desires. Unwanted desires are those desires that take us away from our spiritual practice and attract us to the temporary nature of the material energy. So those unwanted desires can be numerous in number and they can be quite complex due to our continual association with material energy for life after life. But the process of bhakti works. If we stay in one of these nine or more, we can, most devotees do a combination of at least the first seven. Number eight, becoming a friend to Krishna and surrendering everything as described in the Shastras is on the spontaneous platform. So the first seven can be done by sadhana bhakti and the last two are in Baba Bhakti. And so, of course, uh, one can practice some of the, some of the other, some of the qualities or activities of Baba Bhakti, but until one reaches Baba Bhakti, one cannot experience the full experience of Baba Bhakti, which is both spontaneous attraction in the mood of friendship or in the mood of surrendering everything our whole life in devotional service. But for us, the first seven become very fundamental in our practice of Krishna consciousness, and we find ourselves doing a little bit of each one. But hearing is the most important, because by hearing, um, now, it's interesting, because um, we hear a lot of things every day in terms of the sounds and the the words that go around around us in the form of, you know, information that comes through the different medias. But that hearing doesn't awaken any attraction because it's invested with a kind of, what we say, poison, which is attachment to material activities or all about material activities. When we hear transcendental topics from a person who is qualified to speak transcendental topics, that hearing awakens bhakti within the heart. And some of the preliminary experiences of awakening bhakti is one starts to become attracted to what one hears and wants to hear farther and wants to understand deeper what one hears. Sometimes people who practice some form of spiritual life hear from people who are not qualified to speak. In other words, their motivation for speaking is not to give knowledge to their speak, the audience, but to gain something material from their position of acting as a, a propagator or you know, a propagator of religious knowledge. For instance, this, um, we use the example of this Srimad Bhagavad Saptaha. So this goes on, especially in India in many places, where people 
they study or they read various types and parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then they call people together to, and then they recite parts of the Bhagavatam for seven continuous days or maybe a good portion of the day. But these people charge various types of you know, fees for their services. So they take up this Bhagavatam in order to, you know, uh, get some material remuneration in the form of money so they can take care of their family or if they can fulfill their material desires. So although they're, they're speaking the pure knowledge, they're, they are impure in their motivations and therefore it's like, it's like uh, milk touched by the lips of the serpent. So although milk is very pure and very nutritious, if a serpent drinks from it and then you drink from that milk, you can also die from the poison. So these persons, although they're giving uh, pure transcendental, they're giving knowledge from pure transcendental scriptures, it's mixed with their own selfish motivations and therefore the knowledge doesn't take root in the hearts of the listeners. It becomes just a feature of some kind of uh, function it's more of like a, a ritual that people go through. And, uh, they may remember some things, but there's no transformation of consciousness. Only when both the speaker and what they speak, coming from the pure sources such as Guru, Shadow, and Shastra, only when that is there, then the hearing process has benefit. Otherwise, the hearing process, although one can hear the same knowledge, if it's not given in the, in the required way or by the, the qualified person, it doesn't have the same effect like that. So we have to hear from pure sources and we have to hear with rapt attention because by hearing with rapt attention, one could absorb both the knowledge and the purity of sound that coming from the qualified speaker. When both are there, then that knowledge, not only awake, that, that, that hearing not only awakens knowledge, but it actually transforms the heart in devotion. In other words, the material dirt that is covering the consciousness of the living entity is gradually diminished and through continuous hearing, just like we have the example of Pariksha Maharaj, he heard for seven consecutive days. And, that's, and he asked questions in relationship to what he heard, and not in a challenging way, but in order to uh, inspire uh, Sukadev Goswami to uh, open up various other areas of knowledge. And Sukadev Goswami was really enlivened by Maharaja's questions and by his attentiveness. He was so attentive that he forgot about any kind of bodily needs, no eating, no sleeping. He just listened for seven consecutive days. And at the end of seven days, he had become fully self-realized. In other words, all the, whatever left of his material uh, con consciousness was purified by the words spoken by the pure soul, Sukadeva Goswami. And then when it was time to meet his destiny, because he was cursed to die in seven days to be bitten by a snake bird, he actually became fully fearless. He had not the slightest amount of fear and he was ready to move to, you know, his next destination free from, you know, his present materials, his present situation, which was probably back home, back to Godhead, uh, obviously, because uh, he actually became fully purified. And so using the example of purity, I mean, uh, yeah, using the example of purity, although we hear, we have to hear both with full attention, the right information, 
transcendental knowledge from the right source. And that gradually brings our consciousness closer and closer to Krishna. Through that process, one gets realizations. In the, in the process of developing the, 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 the uh, feature of hearing, one starts to ask questions. Asking questions is an indication of awakening towards the knowledge. Knowledge for clarification. And as it says in, this, in the Padma Purana, in the process of hearing, if one is hearing properly from the right source, that either questions in the form, form of clarification on what's been given or further questions on the, uh, based on the knowledge given or realization of the knowledge which comes within the heart and mind become a factor, either one of these two things. And so this pro using the process of hearing as the principle of of uh, the initial anga, which awakens our bhakti. And this is true with all the other angas too. They have to be done in the same way. But hearing is fundamental because through the hearing process, we get knowledge of how to perform everything. Knowledge comes by hearing. And reading is another form of hearing because you're hearing you're hearing words which are spoken but printed on pages. And those printed words, when in the form of uh, transcendental knowledge, are not just words. They're means for purification of the heart and realization of the Supreme Lord. Well, that's the power of transcendental knowledge. When heard from the right source, in the right mood, with absorption. Okay, so we can stop there and see if there's any questions on any of the nine processes of devotional service. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for wonderful class on uh, 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 nine processes of uh, uh, bhakti and uh, also the importance of hearing. That is a very, very important actually to remind ourselves all the time how important it is to hear. Uh, Krishna Katha and devotees if you have any questions please ask your questions um, reflections realizations or comments or you can type it in the chat box and I'll read it for you thank you Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glories to Srila Prabhupada and our glories to you. Um, you spoke about uh, the qualifications for, for speaking and uh, speaking about Krishna uh, and topics about him. And uh, I, I just remember that uh, I read a, a post on Dandavat uh, some time ago. Uh, where uh, the devotee collected uh, from Srila Prabhupada uh, quotes uh, the qualifications uh, on uh, speaking about the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, I, it was quite surprising because uh, I, I realized at that time that uh, there are very uh, high uh, level qualifi qualifications for that. And um, still, uh, somehow, by, by Prabhupada's mercy, uh, we can speak about Srimad Bhagavatam in morning, morning classes. And I, just, uh, I was just wondering, could you uh, explain uh, how can we determine uh, what we are qualified to speak about and uh, when we are qualified to speak uh, about Krishna and this philosophy? what we're qualified to speak about and when we are qualified to speak? Yes, uh, um, in what in, circumstances? Well, in general, we can speak about what we hear in general to people in general or to each other, other devotees. But when it comes to sitting on the on the Vyasa sun and giving class within the temple, um, it's evaluated 
that this person has uh, is practicing seriously Krishna consciousness. So their their steady engagement in devotional service. So in the beginning, when a person is not really known by the audience, sometimes they're given a chance to speak. But then again, this is the thing is that they should be very uh, adept at speaking and it's something that because the speaking in these kind of settings in the temple settings means you are on the vyasa san on this, the asana of vyas in other words you are representing your spiritual master and all the disciplic succession so in that one has to have some understanding and at the same time one should be uh, able to present the knowledge in such a way that it's clear to the audience. If it becomes unclear, then the audience will sometimes respond in the form of questions based on clarification of points like that. So there is a type of liberty that is given initially but if it's seen that the person is not qualified to speak after giving the opportunity, then, then that person shouldn't be able to, shouldn't have the right to speak again. In other words, we're represented, we can't create our own philosophy, but at the same time, one who is realized to some degree in the knowledge presents the knowledge accordingly and therefore may say the same thing that is being said by the previous acharyas in their own words. I see. And that's, uh, that's intelligence. So a person who is very intelligent, that's not enough of a qualification to become a Bhagavatam speaker, they have to be more or less seriously practicing Krishna consciousness, and that's evaluated by the temple authorities. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, really helpful. I just uh, would like to uh, add this follow-up question that it happened to me that uh, I made a mistake uh, during uh, giving class. And I was corrected, but after that, after the class, so not in front of every, everybody. And it was quite a bad feeling that devotees left without this thing uh, uh, being corrected. And uh, mm -hmm. does it uh, uh, make me unqualified uh, to follow or, or what happens in this case? Uh, well, no, no. You would, you would prefer to be qualified to, uh, I would say the next time you give class, then you, you make that point that I said this in the previous class, and it was understood that it was not exactly in line with the knowledge. So here is the right answer. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. But to correct the person during the class sometimes can create, create awkwardness. Mm -hmm. But it can be done in the question and answer period and not while the person is speaking the point, mm -hmm. generally. I had that happen to me and it became very disturbing right during the time I was saying it. And the fact is I wasn't wrong. Somebody was correcting me and they were wrong in their corrections. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was even worse. Um, and of course, sometimes we assume we ex assume that something is wrong, but it's right, or something is right, but actually we don't know, and then we assume it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So the best way is that at the end, the devotees should have brought up the point in the discussion. That would have been mm -hmm. the ideal. Mm -hmm. 
in a, in a way that wasn't offensive, but at the same time, uh, wanting to understand what you said in relationship to what is actually correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. There is a question from Janva Mataji. And um, uh, can you hear me Guru Maharaj? I'm here. Yes, uh, she's saying, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances, all glory to Prabhupada, all glory to Guru Maharaj. So she's asking, from birth, I can eat little and only some rice, fruits and nuts. Otherwise, I feel bad. Same with money and clothes. I can earn a little and wear simple clothes or I feel bad. Is it under eating correct for me? Because I see other, they eat a lot more. Eat well, more and lot, yeah. Everyone has to eat according to their own capacity. You eat for three for three reasons, two reasons mainly. One, to keep health and to get bodily, to get the nutrition that the body needs in order to function. And we also eat for satisfaction of the, the tongue. The third one, is there, but for those who are on the highest level, that is just something that happens. They eat mostly and to honor the Lord's remnants, which come in the form of foodstuffs, and to uh, keep their body and soul together in order to execute devotional service. So what works for one person may be different for another person. But the categories of eating have to be with, within the range as given by the Shastras and the spiritual master. In other words, it has to be, uh, has to be prashadam. Otherwise, we shouldn't be taking it. And, you know, don't try to copy everyone else. Just see through your own uh, experiences you get to know how much you need and what you what you can eat that will be helpful to keep body and soul together you have to judge no one can judge for you when it comes to the eating process no one can tell you how much to eat or what, or what kind of foods you should eat. They can say that also, and you can take it or leave it. But you have, you have to know your own body and then nourish it accordingly. Thank you, Guru Mara. She has a last comment saying, saying, I feel a bit different from others. What does that mean? Like she feels that she's different from others. Uh, different in what way? <laughs> and uh, she hasn't mentioned that, uh, Guru Maharaj. Well, maybe because of health reasons. Well, you eat less. That's okay. That's good. Mm. Uh, the whole process of Krishna consciousness is to reduce you're eating until you get to the point of nil. That's actually perfection, but you can't artificially go to that stage of nil. So if you eat less, but the question is, are you healthy? And do you have the energy you need to, to carry on? Because health is connected with eating. Connected with eating, it's one of the means by which health is uh, fortified. Improper eating can destroy health. Overeating destroys health. Undereating makes makes may also be detrimental to the health. That's why the Bhagavatam says, and I'm mean, sorry, not Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, in the sixth chapter. Um, one should one should eat. Let's see, what is that? 
Uh, what is that actual translation? One who eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or doesn't sleep enough, cannot perform the yoga systems. The next verse is Vyoda Sudatma. What is that verse? Um, can't remember the first line. It's six. Go to Bhagavad Gita, chapter six, verse number 17. Yukta Vahara Vihara Syad Yukta Chaitanas Karma Shu Yukta Swapna Vibhoda Sya Yoga Bhagavati Dukaha. Next line translation. He who is regulated in his habits of eating, sleeping, recreation, and work can mitigate all material pains by practicing yoga system. Extravagance in the matter of eating, sleeping, defending which are demands can block advancement in the practice of yoga. As far as eating is concerned, it must be regulated only when it's practiced to take prashadam sanctified food. So go, go to the verse before that. There's no possibility of becoming a yogi if one eats too much or eats too little, sleeps, sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. Regulation of diet and sleep is recommended here for the yogis. Yeah. So just regulate your eating. And regulating means quantity and regulating time also. It's very important for health that we eat at the same time more than it is in terms of what we eat. What we eat is important too, but timing is a big thing because the body will send signals that it's time to eat according to the regulated system that you've set up. When you break your eating regulations, you find that it becomes very hard to, to balance your life and health is jeopardized. That's why people get sick generally. They eat whenever they want and they eat whatever they want and they eat as much as they want. But this is something that requires regulation, both in time, quantity, and in types of food. Of course, types of food is a big range. So one has to see what works for them. People who grow up in India are more inclined to spicy foods, where in the West, spicy foods cause people in the West a lot of discomfort. So your body is conditioned by your environment. So if you eat less than most people, uh, that's not a disqualification. You have to see if it's enough for what you need. That's all. That's the only consideration. Is it enough to keep body and soul together? Soul means that I have the energy to execute devotional service. If I'm too weak or too sluggish because of eat, eating too much or eating too little, and then yoga, as it says there, one cannot pro properly practice the system of yoga. If you're not sure how much to eat, better to, Prabhupada gives the formula. If you're young, it's better to err on the side of eating more. And if you're old, it's better to err on the side of eating less. For a young person, if they eat a little bit more, 
It's not going to hurt them. But for an old person, it, it can. And similarly, the other way around, for an old person who eats a little less than required, it won't hurt them. But for a young person, they might find it difficult. So all these things that I'm speaking are in the Shastras and they're all spoken by Prabhupada. So if you have any questions regarding anything in your spiritual life, you can find the answers through Prabhupada's books, his lectures, everything is there. A little research is required. Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Thank you so much about speaking about the nine limbs of bhakti. And uh, my question is about this particular limb of bhakti perfected by the goddess of fortune. Uh, her is this Pada Sevanam, and she's always worshipping the Lord in that mood. Yesterday, we were reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, ninth chapter. And in verse number 26, in that particular purport, uh, it is mentioned that uh, the, the Lord is, uh, let me read out that sentence. Uh, although the goddess of fortune is the constant companion of the Supreme Lord, the Lord is more inclined to his devotees. In other words, devotional service is so great that when it is offered even by those in low-born families, the Lord accepts it as more valuable than the service offered by the goddess of fortune. So I was a little puzzled because she has perfected this particular anga of devotional service, but yet the Lord accepts the service of other devotees more than hers. Why is that so? Mm. You have to ask him then. <laughs> <laughs> because in I don't know because she's duty bound but if one is serving Krishna in love that's that's higher she's also serving as a mixture of duty and love like that but she's in Dasya Ras, she's not in Madhurya Ras. Yeah, that's just, that's what the Lord says. They'll just take it as it is. <laughs> okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. That's his prerogative. <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble businesses Guru Maharaj. All Guru Shila Prabhupada, all Guru to you. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have a question about the hearing. Uh, I try to listen to uh, quite a few lectures. Um, like even if I'm working, I have some lectures on. I'm listening. But even in the morning, like uh, I listen to Soho lectures, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. But I've always noticed that it's easy to remember Krishna's pastimes uh, in Vrindavan, in Mathura, or any of his leelas. But it's very difficult to understand or follow when the lecture is about the philosophy. And I do not remember anything at all. Like I listen so many lectures, but I don't remember anything that, and my mind is always, I feel like as dumb as I always have been. <laughs> so how can I improve the remembering of, from the lectures? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs>
I don't know what to say to that one, except you are, if you are finding happiness listening to Krishna's pastimes, then continue. All the philosophy is already contained within the leelas. But the thing is, if you don't have a philosophical understanding in the day-to-day -day life in your spiritual practice, you might make mistakes and commit offenses. That's where the philosophy helps because Tattva and Leela are both part of the process of bhakti. Leela is on the higher platform. But Leela is actually the goal. There's a taste, you have a taste for Leela we have no taste for philosophy. But if you don't have taste for philosophy and you can't remember any of it, then um, you should now have some basic understanding because just like we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we have to know what are the 10 offenses and what are the and the explanations of each of the 10 offenses that we have to know. Otherwise, we will commit offenses while chanting and not even know we're doing it. So there is some preliminary knowledge that's required. But when one gets fully fixed in bhakti, then knowledge and renunciation also come automatically, they follow bhakti when bhakti is uh, fixed, when one is fixed in the execution of emotional service. So if you're having no problems in your execution of devotional service, then fine, but you have to make sure you're not committing offenses because unless we know what the offenses are, and how to avoid them, uh, we could find ourselves getting trapped and making offenses and not even becoming aware of it. So there's some knowledge is required. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. That was very useful. Thank you. I'll remember that. I'll try to follow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, Manasi Ganga has a question. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Uh, she's saying, I have found that if I can discuss with someone after class, I remember more and can make connections in my to my life. Yeah, so that is useful. Thank you so much, Mataji. Thank you. Yeah, that's where the philosophy comes alive and through the process of discussion. Well, what you can do after you hear the class, you can see if it's been transcribed in any form and then you can read it. Maybe that will help. That is also a good idea, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, might see, see that. <laughs> Thank you. Or you can do that as a service. You can transcribe lectures. Yeah, that I found. Uh, I noticed that writing something helps. Yes, yeah. So I'll see if Krishna allows me to do that. Thank you, Guru mm -hmm. Maharaj. Susanna Mataji has a question, Guru Maharaj. Uh, she is asking how to rectify this unknowingly made offenses, Guru Maharaj. Hmm. Well, that comes through sincere prayer. From time to time, we have to sincerely offer our prayers, asking for forgiveness were offenses unknowingly committed. Mm -hmm. 
that's the only way. The other way is go to Mayapur and go to uh, Kola Dweep. And there's a place called Devananda Pandit's Ashram. You go to Devananda Pandit's Ashram and you visit there and offer prayers, all your offenses are removed. The reactions of your offenses are removed. But it's not always easy to travel to Mayapur. You just have to offer prayers, praying for forgiveness for unknown offenses. And we commit a lot of offenses. We do a lot. We commit a lot of unknown offenses in the way we do things and how we speak. It's just, it happens. Okay. Offenses are easy to commit. I think Susanna Mataji, that answers your questions. Um, uh, uh, Guru Maharaj Bhakta Robato Prabhu has a question. Hare Krishna, dear devotees and Maharaj. But uh, what I noticed how we in current age don't focus too much to the lectures. We are doing it on the side and our consciousness is divide, divided. I found by trying to be more conscious during class, we would remember more. Okay. Yeah, that's true. And hear the lecture more than one time, the same lecture. I know one devotee was telling me when they have to give a class on one, le on one lecture, they'll spend a couple of days listening to Prabhupada speak on that same lecture, maybe three, four or five times over and over again. Repetition and absorption, memory increases. And when you speak, memory becomes complete. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Devotees, uh, is there any other more questions? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, yes, Prabhu, please go ahead. No, Lord Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble uh, obeisances. Uh, I hope all glories to Sri yeah, Prabhupada. Um, I heard also that the uh, 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 worship of um, uh, uh, Tulasi plant is also removing the uh, unknown uh, committed uh, offenses. Is that right, or was it? Uh, yeah, uh, it says else? that in it says that in a nectar devotion. <laughs> yeah, by circumambulating Tulsi, by watering Tulsi, by offering. Prayers to Tulsi, yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's in the nectar of devotion. Nec I'm sorry. Yeah, nectar of devotion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Tulsi is auspicious. She's a pure devotee, very elevated pure devotee. She's Vrinda Devi, who manifests herself in the form of this plant to accept worship in the mood of Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. Uh, Guru Maharaj, on this uh, worship of Tulsi Devi, which just came, I have a question. I would like to know if you're taking care of Tulsi and you're doing at least whatever you know, but uh, now in the winter time, she leaves her body and uh, 
is that an offense that has taken place because I am not so familiar with taking care of her. I don't know what I did wrong or what I did not uh, take care of. But suddenly one fine day she shed all her leaves and she gave up her body. So is that an offense? And if so, how can we correct that? It is. No one should accept the worship of Tulsi unless they can take care of her. And if they can't, if they don't, it's an offense. And so Tulsi in Western countries requires a lot of attention and the proper environment. So unless one is prepared to, to do that, then they shouldn't accept Tulsi Devi. So now what can be done to, to uh, correct that, uh, to rectify that offense? Prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Sincere prayer. There's two kinds, there's two motivations for prayer. One is a prayer based on an offense. There's two motivations. One is I'm praying because I committed an offense which causes, which caused the problem to you or in general, or I'm praying because I'm afraid of getting the reactions of the offense. So we should, we should combine both of those into one and that's the mood of prayer mm -hmm. thank you guru maharaj we will where's our zoom lady Yes, Guru Maharaj, I'm here. So either move it along or close it down, either one. <laughs> yes, I think we can, uh, there is no more question. Just uh, Mansi Ganga Mataji was letting um, Shri Devi Mataji know that if you have proper lighting, Mataji, or, uh, she always uses special lights for Tulsi Devi. So just to let you know, Shri Devi Mataji. Um, okay, then I think there is no more questions and uh, we can close the call for today. Uh, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for your valuable time and association this afternoon and thank you dear devotees for your attention and your time thank you thank you and, to and tomorrow's class will be in connection with the devotees in charlotte and the verse we'll speak on is fourth canto 31st chapter verse number 10 devotees can go ahead and read the verse and get an idea of tomorrow's class 4 31 10 Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, Srila Prabhupada. Jai. 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 Guru Maharaj ki jai. Shilapad ki jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'll close the call.